we are pretty freshly into a new series looking at 1 Corinthians. Uh, we're going to be spending most of the next year in this letter. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a pretty decent letter, pretty chunky letter. We've had two weeks already in it. Uh, and uh, my hope is that the whole, the whole letter will be very encouraging, very challenging. Um, there will be bits in it where, you, where you'll think, oh, this is, this is stuff we're doing, we're doing pretty well. Like we, uh, this is an encouraging sermon. There will be other parts where we'll be like, wow, that, that's very challenging to me. Uh, there will be some things that will look at our look at our beliefs and our doctrine, some bits that will look at our lives and our activities and our actions and our words. Some bits we'll talk about or we'll read from Scripture how we are to relate to one another, others how we're to relate to God, others to how we're to relate to people in the community around us. Um, it's, a, it's a very thorough book. So let me read today from our chunk of Scripture for today, then we'll pray and we'll get stuck into it. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, still in chapter 1. We'll be next week as well, Uh, verses 10 to 17. This is what it says. Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be united with the same understanding and the same conviction. For it has been reported to me by you, oh, sorry, to me about you, my brothers and sisters, by members members of Chloe's people, that there is rivalry among you. What I'm saying is this. One of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Hey, buddies. Or were you baptised into Paul's name? I thank God that I baptised none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that none of you, so that no one can say you were baptised in my name. I did, in fact, baptise the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't recall if I baptised anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ would not be emptied of its effect. Let's pray together. And so, Father, we want to thank you for these scriptures, for Paul, for those who have preserved your scriptures down through the generations, those who have interpreted for us, translated for us. And so help us to have understanding today. We don't want to just bring to the text our own ideas and opinions, but we want to read uh, your desire for us today. And so help us to have open hearts and minds to your Holy Spirit ministering among us and to your word. We pray this in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Uh, So Paul starts this with with a very kind of, clear and important word. He says, I urge you. I've got something important to say, is basically what he's saying. This isn't just kind of a calm recommendation or if you get around to it or this doesn't really matter, but here are a couple of choices and and you choose whatever you like, just, you know, or here are some boundaries. Rather, he says, I urge you. And he's just started. You remember from last week or if you weren't here, he just said, I always thank my God For you, because of the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus. He's reminding the church in Corinth about their status in Jesus, their position. He goes, that you were enriched in Him in every way, in speech and or knowledge. In this way, the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you do not like any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you'll be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. You are called by Him into fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Man, that's encouraging. That's uplifting. That's helping us understand who we are. Before Paul gets into the, and now I urge you, I've got something very important to say. He helps them to realise who they are in Jesus. Recipients of God's grace, enriched in every way in Jesus. Confirmed testimony, not lacking any spiritual gift, Eagerly, eagerly awaiting Jesus' return. <clears throat> They're strengthened, blameless, called into fellowship with the Son by a faithful God. That's a pump up. That's a good reminder. That's the sermon from last week you just want to have on repeat. When you come against challenges or you come into good times, you're going through difficult times, <clears throat> when you feel like God is far away, when you feel like God is very close, that's the kind of 
sermon you want to hear over and over and over again. That's the kind of scripture you want to memorize. It's a bit long for a tattoo, you know, but it's, it's a good one. I want it tattooed on a heart, you know. But then comes a correction. So Paul, he is a classic with that feedback sandwich. You know the one? You say something positive, then you deliver the challenge, and then you finish with something positive. (laughs) The whole letter of Corinthians is like a feedback sandwich where he starts with that amazing pump up to remind us, remind the Corinthians and remind us who we are in Jesus and the benefits of belonging to him. So wonderful. And then he writes 16 chapters. And then at the very end, he has this little pop-up again. And then like he does in this, <laughs> in this uh, passage where he says something and then he remembers something else. Like, oh, I only baptized these two guys. Oh, actually. And then here's this other group that I baptized as well, but, but nobody else, as I recall. At the very, very end of the letter where he's doing the, the final pump-up again, he also has this little reminder of, oh, I forgot to tell you this little challenging bit. And then here's the end. So he doesn't quite, <laughs> he doesn't quite get it. Um, you know, the great sandwich. But... It starts with remember who you are. Remember whose you are. Remember what you've been made in your union with Jesus, blessed for the day of the Lord. Remember your union with Jesus. And then he goes on and says, and now let's talk about your union with one another. So he highlights what is of primary importance to us, our union with Christ, before he gets to the challenge, which is, there is actually disunity in the body of Christ at Corinth. I urge you, he starts. Again, not an offhand remark. It's the very thing he's keen to get to. He will write, again, 16 chapters here, but the very first thing he wants to talk about is their unity. First, their unity the union with Jesus, and then the union with each other. It is of primary importance to the church. And living out much of what comes from the following chapters will be or will rise or fall on their union with one another, on their unity with one another. And so he says, you must have no divisions among you. You must have the same understanding. You must have the same conviction. The basis of his appeal. He's not just suggesting unity. He's not saying, you know what would help you? You know what would lead to a great life if you would just have better unity with one another? Or you know what would help your missional efficacy, your effectiveness in your witness would be if you would get along better. And when you don't get along, put you in the get along t-shirt until you get along. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying, you know, here's a good idea. This will help you. Five steps to, to unity, to have a, a more peaceful life. It's not what he's saying. It's a reminder. And he implores it by the authority in Christ Jesus. He says, I urge you by the authority in Jesus, not by my authority, not by worldly wisdom, but by the authority of Jesus. It's important what he's about to say. He's reminding us our unity isn't based on our preferences. It's not based on our convenience. It's not based on our social standing. It's not based on the clothes that we wear, although the setup team and the sound team were all dressed the same today. It was wonderful, accidentally. Uh, Our union with one another, our unity is not based on how much money we individually have. It's not based on what kind of jobs we have. It's not based on what kind of house we live in. It's not based on what kind of car we drive. It's not based on what political party we support. It's not based on anything else or grounded in any other reality other than our common allegiance to our King Jesus and our unity, our union with him. So Paul starts there. He says, you are united with Jesus. How can there be divisions in the body? If we are all united to him, we also necessarily must be united. We're not united around anything else, not grounded on anything else, not anchored on anything else. No other foundation other than Jesus. So what what he's saying is, uh, it's not a superficial agreement that we have with one another. It's It's not just this kind of surface level, high level, where we, we just have this kind of agreement here and we have disunity down here, but we'll just, we won't talk about it or hide it or we won't 
confess sin or we won't identify sin in someone else's life and call it out. We won't rebuke. We won't correct. We just have this veneer of unity, which is not unity at all. He's not saying that at all. So we have the deepest possible level of union, and that is we are united with Jesus and we are united with one another. He isn't talking about just any kind of divisions. He's not saying we can't disagree or have preferences. Uh, he's, uh, again, we can't, he's not saying we can't bring a correction when necessary. He has a very particular kind of union, very particular kind of unity in mind. In fact, we should be the best at disagreeing. Christians should be the best at having disagreements because we should be the quickest to repent when we're wrong. We should be the quickest to forgive when we are wronged because we're people of truth. So we can talk about ideas and disagree about ideas in our pursuit of the truth. Uh, because we don't think of ourselves more highly than we ought, we should be able to disagree really, really well. Uh, because we want to win people and not arguments, we should be able to disagree really well. Because we should be unoffendable as Christians, we should be able to disagree really, really well. Knowing our sinful state before a holy God, knowing about His unmerited grace towards us, knowing about His mercy towards us, His undeserved love for us, it's incredibly humbling. It's incredibly leveling with those we call brothers and sisters, that we don't stand on some moral uh, high ground or high horse, but rather we have a better perspective of who we are in Jesus. We are all the things Paul has just mentioned in his opening of the letter. We are recipients of God's grace, enriched in every way in Him. We have a confirmed testimony. We're not lacking in any spiritual gift. We are eagerly awaiting Jesus' return. We are strengthened, blameless, called into fellowship with the Son by a faithful God. That is, that's us. <clears throat> and so when we disagree with one another, that is our foundation. That's that's the basis upon which we bring a correction or we receive a correction. It's based on those things. So we who are in Jesus, and being in Jesus, helps us to not kind of vest importance in our ego or in our pride. So our pride actually can't be damaged because we put our pride to death. And I know a lot of these things that I'm saying sound aspirational, maybe for, for many of us or for all of us. And, and in fact, in some degree, they are aspirational in terms of those are the things that we want to pursue as we pursue Christ-likeness. But they're all the things that we can be and that we are called into as we're called into Christ-likeness. So this context of Paul's appeal is addressing a particular kind of division that is wholly unhelpful for the church. Divisions and disunity distorting the message of the gospel which should be centered on Jesus and his work of the cross, not on human leaders, not on celebrity wisdom, not on a tribe over here or a tribe over there. So here's what Paul's saying. It's our allegiance to Jesus, not to Christian leaders, not to even very gifted pastors and preachers. Saying our allegiance can only be to our King Jesus. There are no other tribes or allegiances that we can have. So saying some claim to follow Paul, others Apollos, others Cephas, that's Peter, like one of the 12. It says these divisions, they're more than just preferences. They're threatening not just the unity of the body, but the mission of the body. They're threatening the clarity of the gospel call. Because instead of people saying, I follow Jesus, they're saying, well, I follow Paul. I follow Peter. I follow Apollos. Allegiance to human leaders overshadowed their allegiance to the King Jesus. And Paul's writing to them, like Chloe wrote to him, <clears throat> saying, What's the, what do we do with all these divisions? And he writes back and says, we can't have those kind of divisions. We've spoken about this before. There are some things that we need to divide over. We spoke about it maybe a month or six weeks ago. There are some 
doctrinal issues that we need to divide over, some that we need to disfellowship over, some that we uh, maybe just need to be in different churches about. But when it comes to things like this, like <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm, I'm an Apollos guy, or I'm a Peter guy, or I'm a Paul guy, he's saying those are the kinds of divisions that are wholly unhelpful when we agree on everything else. And we're, we are picking tribes like Apollos. He's the best preacher. I'm hitching my wagon to the best preacher. He makes me feel good. He does a great job. Uh, I have a better social standing because I'm one of Apollos's guys. But well, I'm a Peter guy, right? Or a Peter girl. <clears throat> uh, he was one of the 12. He walked with Jesus. He was one of the three. He was in the inner circle, man. I'm hitching my wagon to Peter. That's, that gives me importance. That makes me feel closer to the inner circle. These are the kinds of things Paul's saying. This is foolishness. It's unhelpful. Well, Paul, he's planted more churches. He writes so well. He's written a bunch of scripture. I'm a Paul guy. I'm going to hitch my, wa- my wagon to him. No. These divisions are not just about theological differences. It's a deeper issue of pride, of identity. Remember uh, if you were here a couple of weeks ago at the introduction sermon, we talked about these sophists that were in Corinth at the time. And the sophists were, <clears throat> they were kind of like, like preachers or teachers, kind of like influencers, really, like our modern day influencers, where these are the people that you go to for advice, or these are people that you go to to understand how the world works. These are people that you go to to understand how can I make something of myself. And you, people in the day, would kinda, again hitch their wagon to these sophists, these rhetoricians, these philosophers and teachers who would have their little tribe, their disciples, and if the sophist had some of the cultural elite among his disciples, his his social standing goes up, his credibility goes up, and the better, the higher the credibility of the sophist, the higher the social standing and the prestige of his disciples. And so again, they're in this transactional relationship where <clears throat> the higher the sophist, the better it is for the people and the more attractive it is to the social elite. And the more social elite they have, the higher the standing of the sophist and up and up they go. And this way of thinking had crept into the church. And Paul's saying, no. We are bringing in artificial division in the unity we have in Jesus. So we can't do that. We have all the upper class, all the wealthy over here and all of the working class or the servants over here. We have people who are you know, into one political party over here and another political party over there. We have people who uh, maybe um, support this football team over here and this football team over there. And certainly Paul's saying, man, we can't divide over. Here's my favourite preacher over here. Here's my favourite preacher over there. I'm hanging my identity in this person, my ego, my pride on this person. So can't do it, don't do it. This is the reason Paul works among them as a tent maker. And he says, I I paid my own way. He says, even though I have a right as 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 a worker of the gospel, I have a right to make a living from my work, As an apostle, I didn't do that. And I think it's because of the sophists did that. They're saying, I wanted to give the gospel for free, always, so that I would never add offence to the gospel. So we'd never build the church of Paul, but rather always the church of Jesus. The gospel is already offensive. He didn't want to add any offence to the gospel. The divisions diluted the church witness, diluted the power of the gospel, shifted the focus off of Jesus' finished and sacrificial work and onto the preferences or the giftings of a particular human. Unfortunately, even though we've had this letter to Corinth for 2,000 years, this still is rampant in the church today. I'm not just talking about like having different denominations that might be named after someone like, like a, you know, the Lutheran Church or, not that, or the Wesleyans. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where 
we have people even in our church, well, not this church, obviously, but like the church, obviously, who will say things like, well, I mean, I follow Keller. Keller's my guy. I follow, I follow Vody. I follow, I, I've watched all of Winger's YouTubes. Uh, I follow Fertig. Hopefully that's not one of you guys. Uh, really errs into a kind of Gnosticism that says, we have the secret knowledge. We have it. You don't have it. You, you, sure, you're still saved. You're still a Christian. Barely. But if you were in my tribe with my guy, then you too could have access to the secret special knowledge. I, I see it often online in fan groups or different d- theological discussion groups where they say, someone will say something and then the person will say, that doesn't sound right to me. I've got to go see what, what does Tim Mackey say about that? I've got to go see what does Tim Keller say about that? I've got to see what does John Piper say about that? I've got to, I've got to watch Mike Wiggins' 55-hour video on that. What, does, has, has Heiser ever written anything about this? Now I'm not saying don't go listen to who I think are great preachers and teachers online. I'm not trying to have a go at any other than maybe one of the people that I just mentioned. Uh, but when, the, when we start to hang our identity on those preachers, when we start to say, well, if this person says something different to what anybody else says, I'm always and only going to listen to this person. Or you should come and join, again, my tribe, because we have the best guy. We have the special secret teaching that nobody else has. You might not say it like that, but that's really, in essence, what's being, saying, what's, what's being said. That's what Paul's writing against. Allegiance to a teacher, a preacher, or a pastor over allegiance to our King Jesus. So that if Jesus says, do this, but the preacher says, do that, we say, well, I've got to go with my favorite preacher's teaching because my allegiance is to that individual. It's very dangerous. We have a special knowledge, a special teaching that other teachers, pastors, leaders, brands don't have. And because I belong to the specials, I am also special. Because I have maybe even proximity to the special pastor or preacher, that means it makes me more special. It is anti-gospel. The gospel is closeness to Jesus. Again, does damage to the unity of the body, damage to the effect of our, of our witness, takes away the centrality of Jesus and puts it onto a human, puts the focus on someone who didn't die for us in. who doesn't love us. All your celebrity pastors, all of my favourite preachers online, 0% of them love me. And even if they do love me in a general kind of sense, they don't love me like Jesus loves me. Often pastors and preachers fall for it too. They make it about them. It's about me. Man, one of the most... Uh, disheartening or frustrating or insert stronger word here thing, things that I hear pastors and preachers talk about is their platform and it's a it's buying into the exact thing Paul's speaking against here is how do I build my brand how do I make myself great how do I get more followers how do I increase my prestige how do I increase the caliber of my followers so that we can get into that sophist style, Corinthian upward mobility or trajectory. It's actually evil, anti-gospel, anti-Jesus. There are people who, pastors, preachers, who think that people who follow them are beholden to them in ways that scripture never suggests or allows. I've seen this... uh, (laughs) I've seen horrific abuses of this, even in our city. I think they have authority over people's lives in ways Scripture never gives. 
where again, you listen to me, I'll tell you what Jesus says. And then suddenly we have a mediator between us and God where God wants to be our mediator, Jesus himself. In addressing these divisions, Paul reminds the Corinthians, reminds us, it's not Paul, Apollos, or Cephas who was crucified for them. This is a great correction for us, or corrective for us. Who, who loves us? Who died for us? Who welcomes us into his family? Who has given us eternal life? Who has gone ahead to prepare a room for us in his father's house? That's the one who has my allegiance. Only and forever. The core of Paul's argument is that it's Jesus. It's Jesus only who's the foundation of the church. Every leader, doesn't matter how gifted they are, every leader is a sheep just like us. We are all sheep together. We have a wonderful shepherd. He is the foundation. Jesus. Only by focusing on Jesus can we rise above those kinds of divisions. When we have the foundation of Jesus, when our eyes are fixed on Jesus, this is when <clears throat> it trumps, for want of a better word, our political affiliations. That's when it, it what's a better word than trumps? It's when it rises above or becomes more central or more important than which preacher we particularly enjoy. We're not building our identity in anything else or anybody else. Only in being, this is why they, they were called Christians. Like little, little Jesuses. Our allegiance is to King Jesus. It compels us, actually, our union with Jesus. Compels us to have union with one another who also have union with Jesus. Because what damage does that do to the body when we all have union with Jesus but not with each other? can't happen. And so we need to remember Paul's urging that we would seek unity with one another. He says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with eloquent wisdom, so the cross of Christ would not be emptied of its effect. This is actually a hilarious part of Scripture. I love it. Where he says, I'm glad I didn't get to baptize anyone, apart from Crispus and Gaius so that no one can say you were baptized into my name. And he goes on and says, I did in fact baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't recall if I baptized anyone else. I'll, I, actually, this is one of my favorite parts of scripture in terms of that kind of Paul writing as he's, uh, you know, thinking, writing as he's thinking. But what he's doing is saying, he's trying to take the emphasis off of himself and onto Jesus. Take the focus off of himself and onto Jesus. Where people would be looking at him and say, wow, you've planted these churches, you've written these scriptures, I am a Paul guy, or I'm a, you know, I belong to Paul. He's saying, no, 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 it's not about me. It's about King Jesus. We've tried very hard to, do, to build that into the culture of our church here. Where we're not about a person, not about a particular preacher, where because of really places like this, uh, even like for me personally, I don't do many baptisms. Our baptisms happen in our discipleship groups, in the very communities in which many people, most of the people who become Christians here, have become Christians in our discipleship groups. And so in, like the, with the unity that people have in those smaller communities, with the union that they have in Jesus, this is where we see most of the mission happen in the church, most of the growth, like I, I mean people growing into the likeness of Jesus, Almost all of the many hundreds of people who've been baptized have been baptized by their discipleship groups or DG leaders. I, I love this. We, we have to be the people who, like Paul says, less of me, I must decrease, he must increase. Less of me, more of him, no longer I that live. Christ will live in me. We've got to be those people who actively take the focus off of ourselves and onto Jesus. So Paul asks a bunch of rhetorical questions, uh, underlining that no apostle, no preacher, no teacher should stand at the centre of our faith. So we need to do the work individually and corporately of saying, who? 
stands at the center of the faith. When I was 19, uh, my younger brother was killed in a car accident. And uh, that was obviously very devastating for our whole family, for my parents in particular. And for me, what I discovered at that time, amongst many other things, was that I had really built a lot of my faith, like a lot of my foundation was actually built upon my parents' faith. And it wasn't until they had this really almost devastating thing happen to them where they were taken, my dad was in ministry at the time, mum too really, they were taken out of ministry, taken out of action. It's a good half a year. I'm not, I was going to say half a year of grieving. It's, there's, there's still grief, right? But a, a decent half a year of deep loss. And during that time I realised I just built so much of my faith upon my parents' faith. And then as much as I would say Jesus is the centre of my faith, actually really the, the kind of, the orbit was around my parents. And it wasn't until that happened that I realised, oh man, I've really built my foundation upon somebody else's foundation and not upon Jesus. And I say that to say to us, we need to do the work, hopefully before crisis comes, of figuring out where is, who is at the centre of our faith and upon which foundation have we built? Is it upon the gospel of Jesus or upon somebody else's understanding or relationship with Jesus? Our allegiance is to him. Our only hope is in him. He's the one that loves you. He's the one that died for you. He's the one that calls you into his family, even into union with him. He is the groom who is preparing for himself a pure and spotless bride, us. It's him. Let's fix our eyes on him. Poor to the Philippians, he says, just one thing. <clears throat> As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of, of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. Our unity, the unity that we have, multiplies our missional effectiveness. When we have unity, when people look into our community and say, oh, they disagree about politics, but they all love Jesus. They have vastly different incomes and they all love Jesus. They live in different parts of town and they all love Jesus. They have different kinds of jobs and they all love Jesus. They support different kinds of you know, uh, sporting teams and they all love Jesus. They recreate very differently, but they all gather on a Sunday morning because of their love for Jesus. It's a, again, don't you see how it's a unity that we have. Like when Jesus says, the new commandment he gives us that we love one another, just as he has loved us, so we are to love one another. And by that love, all people will know that we belong to Jesus if we love one another, speaking to the unity we have in him. So we must pursue unity in him. Let's pray together. And so, Father, again, oh, thank you for the love and the mercy we have received from you. They don't treat us how we deserve, even on our best day, but you treat us according to Jesus' righteousness. And that's wonderful. Please forgive us for the times we've built our faith or put our allegiance upon any system or structure or person other than Jesus. We're sorry. We don't want to do that. Lord, I want to echo or have the same prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17, that we would have the same unity, the same union that you have with the Father, that Jesus has with the Father. Help us to love each other, to lay down our proclivities and our preferences, tear down every uh, structure that we've built our life upon other than the foundation of Jesus and his gospel. 
And Father, help us to love one another just like we've been loved in Jesus. In whose name we pray, amen.